Kaho Mai Kako, a Como Mai to Curtain Call, a program of reviews, previews, interviews, and features of and or with the great art and artists on Maui and beyond. I'm Paul James Brown. Seabury Hall has a long tradition of challenging student theater. By that, I mean the plays. Over the years, such as Dancing at Lunaza, The Diviners, Lost in Yonkers, The Crucible, These Shining Lives, challenged the actors to find and create complex, truthful characters in difficult situations. Marsha Kelly has continued that tradition with Tim Clue and Spike Manton's Leaving Iowa that ran for just three performances this past weekend. It's a comedy that is uproariously funny, but at its heart is an unresolved dysfunctional relationship between a father and a son. The Browning family of Somerset, Iowa, go on vacation, but the process of choosing where to go, getting there, and getting back is one too many of us know all too well. Don, Preston Summit, and Sis, Elena Parenti, torture each other in the back seat. They whine, are we there yet? When are we getting there? Can we, can we, can we, can we stop here, there, anywhere? In the front seat are mom, Molly Ann Murray, and dad, Evan Lippitz, who bicker constantly, and when they aren't bickering, they are trying to control the kids, or he is refusing to admit he is lost, or being a backseat driver in the front seat, or insisting he's not falling asleep. The play begins in the past, comes into the present, and then proceeds to present a series of flashbacks. After the initial car trip, we see Don Grone returning home from his Boston writing job. His father passed three years ago, and they has just discovered the urn with his ashes. They argue about what to do with the ashes, and finally Don convinces them that Dad wanted to go to his childhood family farm. Don volunteers to do the deed, and when he arrives at his grandparents' place, or where it was, it is now a parking lot of a supermarket. Don is completely flummoxed, but he's not going to tell his mom that. He lies to her, and in the meantime, the nostalgic flashbacks help Don reconcile with his dad so he can rest in peace. The conclusion is touching, and the audience knows Don is on the way to healing these old, festering family wounds. The four principals are supported by four other actors, Max McManus, Zachary Brunner, Catherine Hamp, and Bobby Golden, who together play 22 parts. This play is all about the actors with minimal sets and basic costumes. These actors do their job telling a complex story admirably. Preston Summit, as Don, is the son and the narrator. He reveals what is in his heart, and the audience goes on the journey of guilt, sadness, and ultimately reconciliation. It's a monstrous role that calls on all of the acting skills, from slick, funny one-liners to poignant revelations, and Master Summit performs them impeccably. As sis, Elena Parenti, is the quintessential bratty sister who sets traps, fights like a warrior, and lies like a rug. Then, when she is playing sis in the present, the moment she tells her bro she loves him is one of those show-stopping moments. In the role of the hapless dad, Evan Lippitz puts on bravado without machismo. The phone call between Don and he is another telling moment, revealing the amount of distance there is between the father and the son. As mom, Molly Ann Murray is trying to manage the chaos of her kids and the incompetence of her husband without losing her mind. My favorite scene was when she became the driver in the second act, trying to fend off the incessant instructions dad was handing out and the irresponsible advice he was giving her. The four actors playing 22 parts do outstanding work. Max McManus has a deep, sultry voice and brought forth every character portrayed. I particularly enjoyed the cart chaser, a funny, silly role, the Civil War guy, the obfuscating hotel clerk, and the clueless coffee server, Wayne. Zachary Brunner has a presence that is menacing and funny at once. His Joe Hofinger and Jack Singer were particularly effective. Catherine Hamp had a great deal of fun as the cart gal, but her drunk lady was a high point for her. Bobby Golden's grandma, museum attendant, and Aunt Phyllis were a hoot, and her Jessie, the waitress at the Dead End Diner, was truly hilarious and over the top. But her mechanic Jamie, who was encouraged to do John Wayne, and rebels screaming, I'm a mechanic, not a Las Vegas act. But when she exits, she does the king, is a marvelous moment. This play featured clever quips, such as when they take a vote for where to go on their vacation, Don says, elections in Cuba were more predictable. 
And when his father describes their upcoming vacation as fascinating, Don says, fascinating is the family vacation F word. Marcia Kelly has done outstanding work bringing this funny, poignant piece to life. One of the things I particularly was awed by were the many scenes where there was simultaneous dialogue occurring. It was real and cacophonous. This is an exceptionally difficult thing to do. Actors have to recite concurrent monologues to pull this off, and they do it convincingly and often. Bravo. Kudos to everyone associated with Leaving Iowa. Andre Morissette's costume, Miss Kelly's set, Peter Della Croce's sound, and Ava Notarangelo's lighting design and Tash Summit's projection design. After two years, the McCoy Studio Theater is back open, and their premiere show for this new paradigm was a powerful, emotionally engaging, and exceptional work of theater art. The Conversion of Ka'u Umanu was written more than 30 years ago by Victoria Kalani Knubel, and its director, Henry Wong III, was the assistant director for its first production in 1988. So this production has quite a pedigree. The play is about the coming of Christianity to Hawaii in 1820. It focuses on the women of the time. There are no men. We see the pre-missionary period when Queen Ka'aumanu played with regal elegance, power, and brilliance by Lele A'e Buffy Kahe Le Puna Wong, set about to end the kapu system. The play tells us she despised the gods and the priests. While the audience is given a glimpse of what Hawaii was like, we meet two women, Sybil Bingham and Loko Maikai Lipscomb, who marries Hiram Bingham, shortly after Bingham is ordained, and Lucy Thurston, a Laura Ward. One of the funniest scenes is the shock when what Miss Bingham thinks are coconuts are pointed out in embarrassment and horror by Mrs. Thurston as bare breasts. Their description of the heathen natives is condescending. Then two Hawaiians who are close to Ka'aumanu, Hana, Kahana Ho, who is Hapahale, and Polly, Annette Aranix, who we find out later is actually a member of the outcast reviled Kawa, examine the missionary women with equal disdain for all the clothes they are burdened by, their pale skin that has never seen the sun, and their slender bodies that appear to lack basic nourishment. Hana is one of the first to study for baptism. In the meantime, Ka'umanu is dipping her toe into the new beliefs, which she finds lacking in pleasure and male-dominated, like the kapu system she has just overthrown. Mrs. Bingham is presented as the more competent of the two missionary women, both from a Christian perspective and from a human perspective, until later in the second act when Mrs. Thurston has a mastectomy and then the tables turn. There are show-stopping emotional moments like when Ka'umanu insists Mrs. Bingham pray with her for the first time, and when Ka'umanu takes ill, and Mrs. Bingham and Mrs. Thurston nurse her back to health, and when the Christian tenet of forgiveness is explored. It is difficult to single out any of the actors. This was a true ensemble performance of the highest caliber. Every member of the cast was outstanding. Ms. Kahele Puna Wong embodied the queen to perfection. Her stature, her humanity, her quick wit, and her brilliance were all on display. Ms. Lipscomb thoroughly understood who Mrs. Bingham was and brought her to life with respect, reverence, and strength. Ms. Ward portrayed Ms. Thurston's emotional and physical weakness with courageous truth. Ms. Ho brought out not only Hannah's intelligence, but also the deep conflict she has between the old and the new. Finally, Ms. Aronix brought youthful energy, profound sadness, and grief and finally disbelieving joy when she finds acceptance with the missionaries to the role of Polly. This was theater at its best. In his director's notes, Mr. Wong says, quote, I hope I do them and the other artists who work on the 1988 premiere justice, unquote. Mission accomplished, Mr. Wong, in spades. Bravo to all. Well, that's Curtain Call for this week. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Paul James Brown. Ahui ho! Thank you.